The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer. That gives each of you as a believer priest the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. For if we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. Therefore, with that in mind, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to the things that we are note, that we are about to note. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. I'll just read some of the headlines that I have for today and then a small article. Some of the headlines that I have for today, NSA collected thousands of internet communications with no terror connection. The NSA, that refers to the National Security Agency, the NSA can spy on up to 75% of all online traffic. The NSA retains content of emails between United States citizens. The NSA can monitor domestic phone calls made via the internet, such as Skype, etc. The NSA now, or excuse me, Homeland Security tests face scanning boss. Local cops are to scan crowds, and a company has been enlisted by the government seeking surveillance role players. Now, all of this indicates that we might be moving toward a surveillance society, and in such case, when the society goes under surveillance, surveillance excuse me, sur <laughs> yeah, I have a bit of a headache today. When a, when a country goes under surveillance, then it therefore loses its privacy, and when you lose your privacy, you lose your freedom. Here's an article, article I read also uh, regarding Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, a Republican from Oklahoma, and he explained to a town hall of his constituents that he wanted to call a national constitutional convention after reading Mark Levin's new book, The Liberty Amendments. Now, I would definitely recommend such a book if you're into reading these type things. Uh, the reading's not too deep. You should be able to understand it. Uh, here's a quote from Coburn. I used to have a great fear of constitutional conventions, Coburn said, according to the Tulsa World. I have a great fear now of not having one. As the Tulsa World notes, a national convention is called by two-thirds of the state legislatures and is one of two ways the U.S. Constitution can be amended. Coburn made his remarks in Musk uh, Muskogee, Oklahoma. I'm an Okie from Muskogee. I guess that's the song. Anyway, uh, what shocks me about this article is not the fact that he wants to have a constitutional convention. What shocks me is that he had to read a book by Mark Levin to understand that, in fact, uh, the Constitution does call for a constitutional convention by two-thirds of the states. That's what makes us a federalist society. And every sixth grader or every middle school student should understand this. And we have congressmen who don't understand this because they're elected by a populace who doesn't even know why we have 50 states or why we even have states to begin with or why we have a federalist type system in which the states have power along with the federal government having its centralized power and all the power has been broken down into segments because uh, obviously someone with the depravity of the old sin nature perhaps all branches will lust for power and try to overpower uh, one or the other therefore to keep the government limited we might as well keep them fighting against each other so when people complain about Congress not getting anything done, that was the whole design of our Constitution. We didn't want Congress to get anything done because we're Americans, we're individuals, we should be able to do things ourselves under freedom. And that was their idea, a genius plan to keep government limited. But once you lose the pivot of mature believers, doesn't matter what ingenious plan has been created in the past. It doesn't matter that we have the greatest constitution since Yisrael. 
none of that matters once believers have lost their influence. And believe you me, believers have lost their influence in these United States. Now, as a part of this, I just wanted to let you know there was an electrical storm. And we believe that is uh, what caused uh, the message that I'm giving to go astray. So we were able to pull it over into a different form. This is in stereo. It should probably be in mono, since this is mono e mono. I don't know much about technology, but since there's no one speaking with me in harmony, then I do imagine it might sound better in mono. I'll listen to it myself. If it sounds better in stereo, I might just keep it this way. But if it sounds hollow and if it sounds different, that is the reason. Now, yesterday, I just want to clarify something. I did get something wrong yesterday. I'm sure that makes you smile. But uh, it doesn't matter. I got it wrong. I want to set the record straight. Now, as far as the overall um, concept, I got it right. The fact that Israel spent, spent 70 years in captivity during the Chaldean captivity. And if I flub over some words, you'll just have to excuse me until the medicine kicks in and wipes away this headache. So what we have here is from, <clears throat> from the time of, well, let's just start with the fact, and I will correct it when I get to the passage. And let's start with... Uh, the concept was correct, so if you heard yesterday's message and someone asked a question, I don't know if you heard the whole thing, and I admitted that I didn't really have the full answer because I haven't studied the Mosaic Law in eight years. But I did see the 70-year gap there and remembered and recalled to mind the fact that they were under 70 years of captivity for a reason, and that reason was that they did not follow any of the sabbatical years. And I will explain what the sabbatical year is all about and make corrections with regard to those details that I was completely off on. Now, the most important client nation and the key to all client nations is found in the history of Israel as a priest nation. And part of the principles is this. God directs and controls historical activity on the basis of client nations. God directs and controls historical activity on the basis of client nations. Now, a client nation is responsible to do five things, and there are two categories of client nations. There are the Jewish client nations, which we will go over briefly, and then we have the Gentile client nations, of which we will discuss mainly the United States of America, as hanging by a thread right now as a client nation to God. And so we as a client nation are responsible to do these five things. Number one, it must evangelize its own population at home. Fail. Number two, it must communicate Bible doctrine to the believers and the nation. Fail. Number three, it is responsible for the custodianship of Bible doctrine. Now, as far as I know, I don't know any Bible teachers overseas. And as far as I know, all biblical doctrine right now, we are still the custodians of such. Number four, it provides a haven for the Jews. We still are a nation that provides a great haven for the Jews. But as far as uh, leadership is concerned, we are walking on thin ice because there are hints of anti-Semitism. And I won't go into the details of how I know this, but it's simply from reading some news articles and understanding the current policy toward Israel that the United States has, and also the fact of what the IRS has been doing to certain Jewish groups. And it's a travesty, for no client nation can be a client nation if there is... If that nation is anti-Semitic, that has been true through all of history. And we are on the brink of losing our client nation status. And this makes it all the more assured if we do not have a change in attitude as believers toward the word of God. 
And number five, it is responsible to send out missionaries to evangelize other nations. With few exceptions, fail. Now there were five Jewish client nations in the Old Testament. We went over this last night. I'll go over it quickly so that we can get down to the sabbatical year. And I can give you the details on it since I was asked a question concerning the sabbatical year. Now first of all, we had the Theocratic Kingdom. The Theocratic Kingdom lasted for about 420 years, from 1441 B.C. to 1020 B.C. And that means that existed from the time of the Exodus until the time of the prophet Samuel. Now what does it mean to be a Theocratic Kingdom? It means the Kingdom is ruled by God, and in this case, the second member of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. They did not have a king. Jesus Christ ruled them. Although Jesus Christ was absent from them, Jesus Christ was their ruler, and that is what is called a theocratic kingdom. And that lasted for 400 years. And then suddenly, during a time of degeneracy and apostasy, the people of Israel decided that they wanted a king. And this was under the time of the great prophet Samuel. And Samuel fell all apart because here go the Jews wanting a king. And he thought, well, why aren't they satisfied with Jesus Christ being king and me being his mouthpiece, the prophet? This is the way it's been for 400 years. What? And he took it personal and he said, why are they doing this now? Is it because I'm prophet? And he became very introspective concerning these things. And then God had to snap him out of his nervous break now and say to Samuel, Samuel, stop crying. It is not you whom they have rejected. It is me. And then God gave them the freedom to choose, the freedom to choose a king. And he told Samuel, step aside and give them that freedom. And when you give them that freedom, give them this freedom to do so with these warnings. That taxation will be high, that regulation will be ridiculous, and that uh, your life will not be as good under a king. So he relayed this message to the people, and the people still said, rah, rah, we want it, much as the people in the United States are still continuing to say, rah, rah, we want socialism, though it's obvious that it has failed miserably, and wherever it's tried, it, it fails miserably. But if we were to have a greater pivot, none of this would be going on. Then we have the fact that we have the United Kingdom. And that would be North and South United. And Israel was uh, broken into North and South uh, due to uh, many different things, cultural things, uh, and different aspects of the different tribes that lived in the North and lived in the South. And we have, we actually had our own revolution between the North and the South, and we still have cultural differences, though we are still the United States of America. Well, they had a United Kingdom and that United Kingdom lasted from Saul until the time of Rehoboam. Now under Rehoboam, Rehoboam was not a great king. In fact, he was terrible. And from 1020 until 926, we have the United Kingdom. And then when Rehobo uh, Jeroboam came to power, the kingdoms had been split. So Jeroboam took over the northern kingdom of Israel, which, is a which was a client nation. And that lasted from 926 to 721. The southern kingdom was also, at the same time, uh, a client nation. And they lasted from 926 until 586. The north fell first. And the north fell in 721 BC. Uh, they went under the fifth cycle of discipline. It was administered by the Assyrians under Sargon II. And then the southern kingdom. It lasted from... Rehoboam, and he decided to rule the southern kingdom, to Zedekiah, and that lasted again from 926 to 586 B.C. And then the fifth cycle of discipline was administered by the Chaldeans. You may hear them in history called the Babylonians, but it was actually the Chaldeans under Nebuchadnezzar. And again, Nebuchadnezzar at the time was a vicious unbeliever. But uh, out of this... Uh, 70 year captivity came many visible heroes such as Daniel and during the time of Nebuchadnezzar he uh, went psychotic under negative volition to the gospel 
he started eating grass like a cow, and then after seven years, he recovered from his psychosis and then accepted Jesus Christ, looking forward to the cross, and then became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, which had a great impact, along with the visible hero Daniel, on both the Chaldean Empire and the Persians, and they uh, have had, and they had, as a result, quite a number of believers. And that happened during the 70-year captivity. And it was the 70 years that caught my eye and brought to my memory the fact that there's an importance to that 70 year. I knew that. And the 70 years would be from 586 until 516. Subtract that and you get 70 years. And the 70 years has significance because for 490 years, and now we're going to get into the details of it, the details that I did not give exactly right, and so I will explain to you what is the sabbatical year. And for 490 years, under the law of Moses, the Jews were to celebrate a sabbatical year. That's found in Exodus 23, 10 through 11, and Leviticus 25, 3 through 4, among a few other passages. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Now, what is the sabbatical year? Well, it was a test, and it happened every seven years. <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, every seven years. And it became a test of Israel to see if their pivot was large enough, to see if their pivot was large enough to have had enough effect on leadership, in which leadership would say, we will follow the law, and on the seventh year, we will stop all work. And that's what it was all about. The function of work would stop, and everyone in Israel would go on a one-year vacation. That's why when somebody disappears and goes into study, for example, if someone were to receive a tremendous amount of Bible doctrine at once to go over, and they decide to cease teaching the Word of God in order to go over this Bible doctrine, in order to grow spiritually, that would be called a sabbatical. It means a time of rest, a time of no working. And during that time was actually for them a one year vacation. And if they had followed these laws of divine establishment, which they had been following, but if they had followed the sabbatical, it actually would have been a wonderful vacation for them. But it just simply showed that they did not have a pivot of mature believers. For under the spiritual life in Israel, they only functioned under the fact that they would rebound and then utilize the faith rest drill. For most believers in the Old Testament, as far as they went, their spiritual life was strictly the faith rest drill. And so, under the faith rest drill, they should have been able to relax during that sabbatical year, not worry about where an income would come from, and take a vacation knowing that God would provide. And it was a test to that client nation that they failed. And for 490 years, each sabbatical year came up every seventh year, and every seventh year they did not follow it. They continued to work as usual, and they did not make any attempt to follow the sabbatical years. And so the failure of the Jews to observe the sabbatical year was the basis for determining how long they would stay under the fifth cycle of discipline, under the Chaldeans. And this uh, occurred, and if you take 490, divide it by 7, you get 70. So you have 490 years. And then they missed the sabbatical for all those 490 years. So during that 490 years, they would have a seventh year in which they had to follow the sabbatical, divided by 490, you get 70. And so there you see God in his magnificent, phenomenal sense of humor. He's telling the southern kingdom, hey look, since you didn't follow, and since you missed 70 sabbatical years, you will return those sabbatical years during 70 years of slavery. So that is the detail regarding the sabbatical year and should explain 
the question that was asked of me yesterday. Well, let's continue now. Uh, during those 70 years, by the way, there was no client nation operational, none at all. But to fill in the gap during that time, there were visible heroes, such as Daniel. But then Judah once again became a client nation in B.C. 516, and they lasted as a client nation, Judea, or Judah, all the way until August of 70 A.D. Now, Chaldea and the Persian Empire were not client nations between 586 and 516 B.C. And what was the problem? Why did Israel go under, and why did they go under the fifth cycle of discipline? Well, it's because they did not have a pivot of mature believers large enough that would give them the leadership strong enough and with enough backbone and, in, and, and would not be in terms of trying to compromise all the time as we have today. They would simply say, this is a sabbatical year, no one works, it's the law, period. But that did not occur because the, because the pivot was not large enough and very few people in Israel were functioning under the faith rest drill, which was the means by which they would form their pivot. Now, there were a few great doctrinal believers during that time, such as David, who got as far as grace orientation and doctrinal orientation. But during that time, you must, uh, re you must remember, they did not in any way, shape or form, have any relationship, most believers, had no relationship in the Old Testament with God the Holy Spirit. Now we in the church age constantly are indwelled with God the Holy Spirit. As far as the filling of the Holy Spirit, that depends upon rebound. If you take your volition and say, I've sinned, I will stop, I will stop justifying my sin, I will stop deceiving myself into thinking I had a right to sin, I will stop being self-absorbed in my sin, and I will simply name my sin to God, then you are forgiven that sin and also restore the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Well, in the Old Testament, they didn't even have the indwelling of God the Holy Spirit, which is a position for us, in which the moment we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive the in, both the indwelling and the filling of the Spirit, but as soon as we sin, we lose the filling, but maintain the indwelling. And uh, so as soon as you believe in Christ, all the way through your time on this earth, you are indwelled as a believer with God the Holy Spirit. And you have an extra relationship under the filling of God the Holy Spirit, in which it acts as a teacher for you, your mentor and teacher, and the one who brings to your memory those things you have forgotten oftentimes even when your memory is shot and doesn't want to work too well. So we have in the Old Testament the simplicity of their spiritual life. We have something far greater. The simplicity was this. They would rebound and utilize the faith rest drill. So it is negative volition to Bible doctrine that destroys a client nation. It was negative volition toward Bible doctrine that destroyed the nation of Israel. And that's why they spent 70 years in captivity. An overt manifestation of that would be the fact that they did not follow any of the sabbatical years, which showed that not a large enough pivot was there in order for the leadership in the land to have enough cojones, to put it in other words, to say, look, we're going to follow the law. So they did not. And their pivot shrank to the point to where there were too many reversionists, the apostasy was too great, the degeneracy was too great, and God had to take them out under the fifth cycle of discipline and again, in his sense of humor, gave them 70 years of slavery to make up for the 70 times that they missed their sabbatical. Now, there were periods of apostasy in Israel in the Old Testament. And apostasy in the client nation is always a cancer. And I'll give you an example of apostasy. Instead of teaching Bible doctrine, pastors have become the greatest beggars in this country in all of human history. They're able to swindle you out of money through guilt complex. 
by distorting what it says in the book of Micah by telling you that you have to give a 10% in a tax or a 10% tithe is what they call it. Tithe means 10% to the church. And they should know that this refers to an income tax that went into the treasury of Israel and of Israel only. This does not apply to the church age. The doctrine of giving has come, it, it has to do the same now as it did in the Old Testament. Uh, they just had to pay their income taxes just as we must pay our income taxes. Though our income tax system is progressive and unfair, their income tax system was absolutely fair in which everyone, rich and poor, pay 10% across the board for one area of taxation. And then there was another area of taxation in which they paid 10% across the board. And one more area, I won't go into detail, I don't have time. But there were three areas of 10% income taxes. And so they had a rate of 30%. But also every third year they had a 10% income tax in order to provide for the poor. And that would... Uh, indicate that if you were to uh, push it out in terms of if you were a person who watched your money and you were anticipating the 10% income tax on the third year, you would have a an effective tax rate of around 33.333% per year. A third of their income went to the treasury in Israel. And that is how their income tax system worked. And in the book of Malachi, not Micah, I said Micah because I'm not thinking that straight, but in the book of Malachi is where they have this 10% taxation mentioned. And it was to go, if you read in the passage, to the treasury. But I'm not here to give you a study on tithing. I think I've given it before and I will be giving it again. But it's nonsense. It's a preacher begging. It means apostasy in the land. And when preachers become beggars instead of stewards of the word of God and teachers of the word of God, then you have apostasy in the land. And that is exactly what has happened to the United States. And I will never lower myself to the level of beggared. I am a pastor teacher and will give you the word of God. In fact, right now, I accept no money. Any monies that come my way are automatically rejected. If I receive a check, I tear it up. If any asset is transferred, it is not allowed. Any gift transfer is not allowed. I do not accept anything. Now it is my right, as the ox treads out, as it says uh, under Paul, to accept gifts. That is, people who freely give money based on their own decision. But because of certain circumstances at the time, I've made the executive decision to accept nothing, and it will remain that way for a while. And uh, you, you might say, well, why don't you go under the biblical method and allow payment? The reason why is because I am not a tax-exempt organization, nor will I ever be a tax-exempt organization. And uh, that's because of the fact that the government is getting too involved in the church's business. It won't be long before they say you can't teach this and you can't teach that and you can't teach the other. After all, we're the ones who have given you this tax exempt status. You know what I say to that status? Stick it. I'm going to have freedom to teach the word of God and I'm going to teach it as I want to teach it and I'm beholden to no one. So that's one of the reasons why, among others, and also to establish the fact that my motivation is absolutely pure. I'll have to work with my own hands. I do not care. And you will still receive free of charge the manna from heaven, the word of God, because that is my motivation. My motivation is to make sure believers wake up to the fact that Bible doctrine is the most important thing that could ever happen or occur in their life. And they should take every advantage and every opportunity to take in the word of God, to metabolize the word of God, to be filled with the spirit, and to transfer gnosis in the Greek, G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, academic knowledge of the word of God, into epignosis, E-P-I-G-N-O-S-I-S, -S, beyond knowledge, into 
that is to convert academic knowledge into that which is beyond knowledge concerning the unique spiritual life of the church age. That is my motivation, and it will not be questioned. Or it may be questioned, but they'll have no basis for it. Now in every case of Jewish apostasy, in the Jewish client nation, they lost uh, well, what happened was the apostasy affected both the clergy and the politicians along with the general negative volition of the populace. Now in Jeremiah 6, 13 through 14, it says, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is ready for profit. Furthermore, from the prophet, P-R-O-P-H-E-T, from the teacher of doctrine, or who should the one who should be teaching doctrine, even to the priest, the one who performed the ceremonies related to teaching doctrine, that would be they would sacrifice a lamb in, in order for the people to have a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, having the sins of the world imputed to him and judged, which would be a future event for them, a past event for us. Furthermore, from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone manufactures lies they go into deceit and there are a lot of pastors who call claim to be pastors and there are a lot of those who are claiming in every way to be something great when they are nothing and when they are doing nothing and sometimes with knowledge producing deceit in order for monetary gain or for the gain of approval lust which is called approbation lust that's also called lying to God the Holy Spirit. Anytime your motivation related to any type of what would be considered Christian service or any type of what would be considered spiritual modus operandi, that is called lying to God the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 5, when we get back to Acts, we will study Ananias and Sapphira and the first very public of the dying of the sin face to face with death. So in fact, they alleged to solve the problems of my people, saying, Shalom, Shalom, peace and prosperity. That was a greeting which meant peace and prosperity. You have peace, peace. But they didn't repeat peace, peace. They said, Shalom, Shalom, peace and prosperity, when there is no Shalom, peace. Then in Ezekiel 13, 10 through 16, which we went over and we will go over briefly now, it is definitely because they have misled my people by saying peace, when there is no peace. Now, when anyone builds a wall, that is the political lies of politicians, in those days the lies of the prophets and the lies of the priests, behold, they will, they will cover it up with whitewash, that is the false solution to the problems of the client nation. So tell those who plaster it over with whitewash that it, the client nation, will fall. A flooding rain will come and you, O hailstones, will fall. And a violent wind, referencing the fifth cycle of discipline, will break out. Behold, when the wall has fallen, will you not be asked? Where is the plaster with which you have plastered it? Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will cause a violent wind to break out in my wrath. There will also be in my anger, and that again is an anthropopathism. What's an anthropopathism? It's a way for God to demonstrate his attitude towards something in ways that we can understand. We can definitely understand anger, but God does not possess that of anger because God is love, and love does not get angry. So God has never experienced anger, but he puts these in terms, anthropologic terms, anthropocentric terms, therefore that means man-centered, man-centered terms, so that we can understand it due to our limited vocabulary and our limited frame of references. Reference. So he says, in my anger, which is not really anger at all, but simply demonstrates his attitude toward apostasy. In my anger, a flooding rain and hailstones will consume you and consume it, the client nation, in wrath. So I shall tear down the wall, the political lies, which you plastered over with whitewash, and bring it down to the ground, so that its foundation is laid bare. Then... <clears throat> Furthermore, when it falls, you will be destroyed with it. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Therefore, I will spend my wrath against the wall and against those who have plastered it with whitewash. Then I will say to you, the wall is gone. 
along with his plasterers, along with the prophets of Israel, who prophesied to Jerusalem and saw visions of peace and prosperity for her when there was no peace, declares the Lord God. And I did mention how all of the numbers through the media and through the government have been manipulated so that things look better than they really are. And they did the same thing during the time of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. During Ezekiel's time, they were trying to whitewash how bad things were. They were trying to whitewash the unemployment rate. They were trying to whitewash the fact that the military wasn't in as great a shape as everyone thought. And they made everyone think that everything was going just fine, and yet everything was going to hell in a handbasket, and they were about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. Now there are some principles from this that we went over quickly. And we will go over again today. Uh, well, actually, we won't go over all of these principles. I will just put it to you this way. There is no political solution to the problems that we face in this nation. Stop seeking one. There is no political solution to the problems we face in this nation. Stop seeking one. Why? Because it takes a spiritual revival first. There must be the vigor of the pivot of mature believers first, and then a political solution can be effected, such as during the time of Ronald Reagan, in which a million tapes were being pumped out by Colonel R.B. Thing Jr., and many people knew the terms that I am using now. Many people, uh, not a majority, of course, but enough to form a pivot large enough to bring blessing to the nation. And I mentioned to you, we went to a for a system of government to that much like Israel in terms of taxation. We had two tax rates. There should be one, but Reagan had to deal with Congress, and therefore a compromise was made in which there were two tax rates, one at 15% and one at 28%. And uh, the taxes had not been seen at that level since the 19-teens. And great amounts of money began to uh, create itself. Wealth, not just money. You can print money. But actual wealth began to uh, create. And therefore, the amount of money coming into the government, you can look it up for yourself. Google it. Google the revenue from 1981 until uh, Reagan left in 19 uh, January of 1989. And you will see that revenue actually doubled. So that means spending had to move more than double, and that is courtesy of Congress. Congress being the House of Representatives plus the Senate, the House of Representatives holding the purse string spent the money like crazy. And we also had what was necessary, a massive military buildup, which brought the Soviet Union at that point to its knees. The Berlin Wall fell shortly thereafter, all due to the fact of the pivot that had been created and the fact of the leadership that came along as a result of that blessing by association to this client nation, to God. We are a generation separated from that today, and it was Ronald Reagan who said, it only takes one generation to lose freedom. And we are losing it at a rapid pace. We're destroying ourselves. And if believers do not wake up to the fact that we need to get back to the basics, that is back to our spiritual life, and we need to stop caterwauling in the Pentecostal church, you see Jesus Christ tested and proved the prototype spiritual life. What is a prototype? Well, we have the F-22. Now, when the F-22 was first created, there was a prototype. And then after the prototype was created, tested and proved that it was a magnificent plane, they went ahead and decided to build the protocol of each of these aircraft. And they all, and they had began, like, at least begun to build these F-22s. I believe right now we've stopped building them, but I'm not 100% sure, but I did read that we were considering or had stopped building 
this wonderful new generation aircraft, the F-22. <clears throat> I've seen one fly, by the way, at an air show. It's a magnificent plane that can do things that an F-16 can't do, and this F-16 is top of the line of its day. But the principle is, Jesus Christ fulfilled the prototype spiritual life, and nowhere in the Bible, when it's referencing the spiritual life of our Lord Jesus Christ, does it show him jumping up and down, running around in circles, caterwauling, rolling around, running up and down aisles, frothing at the mouth, and acting like an utter fool in order to fulfill a spiritual life? Because that is not the spiritual life. That is holding to a form of the unique spiritual life, which would be Eusebia in the Greek, but rejecting its power. You are running under the energy of your own flesh. For if you say, I am spiritual because I can run around and shout and do all of those things, then what about the people with no legs? What about the people who can't raise their hands? They have no arms. What about the paraplegic who can't do a thing? You see, the spiritual life is thinking. It's not related to what you are doing in the energy of your flesh. The spiritual life is related to, related to the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and thinking by the doctrine. If you don't believe that, you're in the wrong place. Go listen to someone else. There are many people out there who will tickle your ears. Go have them tickled. So political solutions are useless without the spiritual solution. And what makes the political solution great is the invisible hero ship. And we're invisible uh, by the very fact no one knows our name if we execute the spiritual life. But we do have an impact that is unseen to the rest of the world and unseen even to yourself. But you do have an impact that is seen by the angels and an impact that is seen by God. So what makes political solutions great is the invisible hero ship of the mature believer. For political solutions are temporal, as you can see, uh, from the fact that we've gone from Reagan to what we have now. But spiritual solutions are eternal, as you can see, for the spiritual life is still being taught in the same way. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Political solutions are often erroneous and destructive to a client nation, such as socialism, redistribution of wealth, all of the things that we are following right now. And while spiritual solutions offer hope to a nation and eternal life to individuals in that nation, the political solutions offer none of these. Political solutions, therefore, are mortal and subject to corruption. Spiritual solutions are eternal and compatible with the immortality of the soul. Political solutions grope in darkness, and boy, do we ever have politicians groping in darkness. And it signifies the fact that man is born spiritually dead. But, but spiritual solutions live in the light of eternity, and the fantastic divine revelation in time which we have been given. Political solutions are related to the first birth of mankind and his spiritual death, Spiritual solutions are related to the second birth, regeneration, and therefore faith alone in Christ alone, the second birth of mankind and his eternal relationship with God. Spiritual solutions never include violence or coercion, but a change in the soul through Bible doctrine. In other words, any type of Christian activism is antithetical to the plan of God. That means the opposite of. And it will not fulfill God's plan for you. It is not God's plan for you to take up arms and to go run up against a government that seems unfair. Most governments are. Just be glad you live in the United States. Even though we have our problems, I still wouldn't live anywhere else. And you never, ever take up arms against your government. I don't care what our forefathers said. They did not understand fully the unique spiritual life. And we, out of all people on the face of the earth, have no excuse because we have duly elected the people we want in office and therefore get exactly what we deserve. 
and do not stand in the way of God's divine discipline to this country by going into some sort of, so some sort of activism or some sort of civil disobedience. That I reject and that the word of God rejects. If you get involved in that, you deserve whatever punishment comes your way, both from God and the legal system. The only way we can survive as a nation is invisibly through the spiritual life. For one thing government cannot do is take a peek inside of your spiritual life. Now we will continue tomorrow night and we will continue uh, back with the system we were using before and continue with our study of freedom and now specifically under the concept of freedom, the client nation to God. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and freedom of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and challenge us to all that we have studied. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.